Okay, so welcome to today's uh, Turing tu lecture or tutorial, <coughs> not quite sure what it's called. Anyway, it's on time series. Uh, it'll be given by Yanis Papastatopoulos from University of Edinburgh. That's the first part. Uh, and then the second part will be given by me, Chris Williams. Um, and so, yeah, so without further ado, Yanis, take it away. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to part one, time series. So my name is Yanis. And I, I work as a statistician in, in University of Edinburgh. Um, so, so the first part um, is is really so just some some simple time series um, models. So I will describe um, uh, well structural properties and, and time series models on on um, ARMA models, autoregressive moving average, and um, I'll place some particular uh, emphasis and focus on uh, forecasting with ARMA models. So, um, um, so what is the motivation basically in time series analysis? Um, so typically, um, in all in all sorts of applications, or uh, in our early days of statistical or, or data analysis, uh, we are um, well. We postulate some toy models. So basically, the starting assumption usually is that we do collect um, a sequence of random variables. Let's say x1, x2, up to xn. Um, and we typically assume that these can be, well, either independent or, in the simplest case, um, independent and identically distributed random variables. Um, of course, our favorite models here um, allow us to, to say that, well, um, we, can, we can put some probability distribution on these random variables uh, and, and uh, say, think of these are being drawn from, from some normal random variable with the mean and, and variance mu sigma squared, respectively. Um, so time series is really um, the study of observations that um, arise in some order, and, and in particular time order. Um, and, and therefore, we can think that, well, our observations or our random variables are no longer independent. That's uh, a standard assumption that's suddenly um, broken. Um, and, and the key thing here is that there can be um, many ways of being dependent and indep independent. Um, so, almost all data are collected in some time sequence, some time order, um, and, and basically time series is, is a vast discipline that you can find it in, uh, in a range of, of applications. Um, so, just, just to give you a flavor, um, they arise in climatology, uh, for example, modeling temperatures, sea levels, um, or finance economics, uh, prices, in marketing sales, um, I mean, the list is pretty much endless. It's, it's really um, a highly important subject that requires us to understand it very well. Um, so just some motivation. I mean, here you, we, we see uh, a couple of first data sets uh, just to start with. So, so these are standard uh, data sets which are, are available in uh, our statistical language um, and our software. So here we, we see um, the annual measurements of uh, the level in feet of, of Lake Huron in the United States uh, from 1875 to 1972. Um, so, so the time series here is just plotted, uh, the measurements are plotted over time, and um, we might start asking, um, well, are these measurements independent? Um, in what sort of sequence do they arise? Um, well, surely we can start teasing out some features here. Um, I mean, does the process have a constant mean? Does it fluctuate around a constant level, let's say? Well, um, it doesn't look like that. We, we can probably say that there is a sort of decreasing mean in, in the time series here. Maybe we can say a few uh, bits and, and, and bobs about the variance. Uh, potentially, the variance might inflate over time. Um, but just these are just simple exploratory things we might just start thinking about. Um, here's another example. That's basically finance economy, growing markets. Uh, so these are. Um, daily closing price, prices of, of four major European stock indices. So we've got the German DAX, uh, SMI, that's uh, Switzerland. Here we've got the French, FTSE of course, uh, UK's um, stock exchange. Um, and we, um, well, we, it's, it's sort of evident that there's a sort of increasing trend here um, with um, potentially oscillations here maybe being slightly different than at the beginning of the series. Um, so, another example here is CO2 concentration. Um, again, increasing trend. Uh, of course, we see some additional characteristics here. We see 
uh, annual cycles, cycles. So, so basically the series oscillates around a sort of increasing trend, um, but, um, well, if we were to think that we're filtering this trend out, we, we, we would sort of be able to say that, well, um, well, this December's CO2 measurement uh, more or less resembles last year's CO2 measurement. So, so here there's a clear seasonality. So seasonality can be more complicated. So you can have sub-cycles, not, not just an annual cycle. Uh, you can have six-month cycles. So here are um, airline passengers data from, uh, these are totals basically in millions of uh, uh, passengers plotted against time, time being from 1949 to 1960. Um, and, and here is the effect of technology effectively uh, uh, being into the series. So there is a, an increasing trend again in the number of passengers. Um, or we can look at the uh, sort of time series. Uh, here, uh, here is just a, a last sort of data set, uh, which, which is the, the number of sunspots. So sunspots are uh, basically um, spots that appear uh, in the sun. They do have that sort of 11 year cycle. And, and these are the uh, monthly totals plotted over time. Um, so again, we um, might just try and tease out some characteristics here. Uh, it's not clear that there is an evident, evident trend, but of course there is um, a sort of uh, distinct uh, cycle uh, appearing in the series. Right, that, that's just the motivation. Um, so how do we basically analyze all these time series? How can we sort of start building probabilistic models that allow us to tease out these features automatically or maybe um, infer uh, properties about, about the evolution of the process? Or, or ideally, can we say something about um, how these processes would look like, let's say, tomorrow? So, so I'm just going to describe a few things about um, or go over, say, some time series uh, basics. So what is a time series in a, in a sort of formal mathematical sense? So it's, it's basically a stochastic process. So it's um, a family of random variables or a collection of random variables, um, x sub t, uh, where t is, is, is well, ranges in, in, a, in, a, in a time set, calligraphic t. Um, and that collection of random variables is defined on a, on a probability space, pretty much meaning that we can allow dependence within, within our random variables. OK, so, um, so with capital T, we, we do denote um, the, the random process effectively, whereas if you want to think about a realization of a time series, um, we, we denote it by a small letter xt, uh, which is just thinking of drawing a so, sort of small omega out of the bag uh, of, of the sample space. Um, so typically in time series, the calligraphic set T, which denotes time, uh, can take various forms. It can be just a real line, or it could be just a set of integers, positive minus, um, or some sort of subset of the real line, let's say. Uh, but because of digitization, uh, we, um, well, basically T, the time index, cannot contain any, uh, say, sub-interval. Okay, so basically, um, measurements are digitized. However, the time step with which we sample our series can be very small. Um, so there the, the are uh, applications where um, delta t, let's say, um, can be just subdivisions of, of the second. Um, well, continuous time series basically can be thinned by subsampling at the points on, on a grid. Or in some cases, we might think that um, for continuous time series, we might do uh, we might be able to obtain discrete time series by uh, aggregating, uh, say, the continuous time uh, process over uh, intervals. So a nice example here being rainfall accumulations. Uh, of course, that's a continuous phenomenon, but we are never able to uh, measure it instantly. So pretty much we aggregate over time periods. Um, so for general discussion, we do take the, the set T to be uh, the integers. And um, so, so basically our time series xt is recorded at time 0 or plus minus 1, plus minus 2, et cetera. Um, right, so just two main situations so that the available data uh, are part of a random sequence for which, t take, uh, for which time t takes only integer values. Um, therefore, 
T X T cannot be recorded at sort of let's say T equals a half or so. Um, or the available data are values of a random function, um, say X T, uh, where T ranges throughout the whole real line. Uh, and that just gives you um, this, this sort of situation where I was describing before, uh, where uh, if we just imagine of, um, well, the scenario of um, measuring rainfall, let's say, um, well, rainfall is a continuous phenomenon, so it's pretty much like a, a random function, uh, but we do um, you know, measure accumulations of, of rainfall in millimeters. Um, of course, if our phenomenon is, is a continuous time phenomenon, um, you know, building stochastic models on discrete time scales might be da dangerous, because um, basically, if we want to change the time scale, uh, then our inferences might not just um, come over as nice from, from our originally constructed stochastic model. So if, if our phenomenon is continuous, we might just want to um, attack it, let's say, or uh, think about building a continuous time phenomenon process. Sorry. Okay, uh, measures of dependence. So, um, so we start always with XT, our time series being a, a stochastic process. Um, and then we can straight off define the, um, say, key ingredients we were describing before with the, the first few plots. So provided that the expected value of the time series at time t is finite, then we can define uh, the mean or the expectation of the process to be uh, denoted by uh, Greek letter mu sub t, which is nothing more but the expected value of x at time t. Um, and if mu t is non-constant, that means it varies over time, um, we sometimes call it the trend. Um, similarly, we can define the variance function. Um, so if variance is, is finite for all time points, um, we can also define the autocovariance, which is basically um, describing uh, the dependence within the time series. So at time t and time s, we might have two, um, say, random variables x, s, and xt. How are these related, basically? Okay. So a similar, sorry, a simple uh, measure of dependence is, is the the piece and uh, product moment correlation or covariance. So so the Greek letter gamma here um, at s t. So so the autocovariance function is defined to be the covariance of x s with x t. So large values of this of this little guy here um, imply basically basically that. On average, um, the deviations of xs from its mean times the deviations of xt from its mean uh, will be positive. And the other way around, if, if gamma is negative, well, these deviations will, uh, the behavior of these deviations will swap around. So, so large positive values of gamma indicate that um, our time series is somehow strongly dependent on these two time points, whereas uh, large negative values means that they are negatively dependent. So if excess is very large under gamma positive, then it's, it's highly likely xt will be large. Right. Um, the key problem, though, with describing dependence purely with the autocovariance is that it's, it's basically um, dependent on, on the unit of measurement. So instead, it's um, more appropriate to define the autocorrelation function which effectively takes away this uh, uh, dependency on the unit of measurement by scaling with uh, the product of the standard deviations. So some notes here. Um, the covariance of xt with itself, so the covariance of the process with itself, is just the variance at time t. And that's gamma t comma t. And by cauchy schwarz inequality, we can straight away see that correlation is bounded between minus 1 and 1. Um, some properties, um, the covariance function is semi-posi definite, meaning that for any, uh, say, real constants alpha 1, alpha k, this sum here will always be positive. Um, and the name we give to these functions is, is basically autocovariance and autocorrelation which are just covariances and correlation, but we use the word auto to describe the dependency within the series. Right, um, stationarity. So we, start, we started the discussion of time series just by saying, well, our, pure, our, 
our standard toy model is just the IID random variables. Okay, so a way of start deviating from this assumption is just, just by injecting into the system this, this dependency or, or a covariance structure or a correlation structure. Um, however, um, as we said, um, time series can be dependent in all sorts of different, different ways than time series where, uh, that are independent. So um, a key notion of where uh, we start extending our probabilistic models to more complicated scenarios, if you like, is, is the notion of stationarity, which in simple terms is, um, well, means that the statistical properties of the time series do not change over time, effectively. So if we denote by calligraphic S just any set, let's say, uh, we can use the notation, say, U plus S, where U can be a scalar or, or a real value, uh, to denote the sort of translated set, um, which is, basically the set that consists of all the elements U plus S, such that S is within the set we picked. Um, we can also um, use um, a nice notation to subscript our uh, time series. So if we subscript our time series by a set, uh, we basically mean the collection or, or the set of random variables excess such that S is in the set. S, calligraphic S. Okay, so, um, Coming back to just what we said, a strictly stationary process or time series is defined to be um, um, a time series where basically for any set we pick in the time index, so any sort of partition, any time points uh, we pick from, from our time index T, and any sort of real value U for which if we translate that set, um, the translated set will still remain in our time index T, um, then the joint distributions of X sub S and X sub S plus U are the same. So that really gives you this, this idea about um, a strictly stationary process being translation invariant in a distribution sense. Um, of course, that's quite a strong assumption. It implies effectively that uh, the mean doesn't change, the uh, variance doesn't change, and it also implies structures, uh, structure about the autocovariance and, and higher order moments. Um, but in, in, you know, in analysis and in, in real life applications, it's sometimes quite hard to check strict stationarity. And um, we can define a simpler, a simpler notion of, of stationarity, which is a second order stationarity, or simply weekly stationary time series, um, which is defined to be um, uh, the case where the mean doesn't change over time, and basically the covariance function gamma st does not really depend on the time points s and t. It just purely depends on how far apart these time points are. So purely depends on the absolute difference of t minus s. Um, so, so just now focusing on our case where we sample on a, on a discrete time index, um, and assuming the process is stationary, we can, we can write our covariance function, let's say, um, at t comma t plus h. Well, surely that does not depend on where exactly we are on the time index, so it doesn't depend on t, purely depends on the difference between t and t plus h. So in other words, that is equal to gamma zero h, um, or equally, well, to gamma zero comma minus h, so it's symmetric around zero, which we can just define it to be gamma sub h. Okay, so the covariance function in cases of stationary processes is just a function of what is known as the lag between where we look our time series. Um, similarly, we can do the same trick with the autocorrelation function and simplify it to a function of the lag. And, and just notice that um, both the autocovariance and the autocorrelation function are symmetric around zero. Right, so as we said, um, strict stationarity is quite hard to check in, in, in practice uh, and to verify it. So uh, well, it basically involves many computations, whereas for uh, second order stationarity, we only need to check whether the mean stays constant, the variance stays constant, and whether the autocovariance basically depends only on the lag. Um, 
you can imagine that we can start extending these sort of definitions by, uh, well, sort of third and higher order stationarity where the skewness will not change or the kurtosis will not change, uh, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so, so the traditional sort of approach for, for time series modeling and analysis is that, um, well, we sort of tease out these characteristics we can see at our data, for example, trends or cycles. So we filter them out and what we hope to is that what we are left with is nothing more but a stationary time series. Um, something that fluctuates around a constant mean level and something that so, so, some sort of process whose objects, uh, who, sorry, whose properties do not change over time. So in practice we often pre-process the data um, and that, that involves uh, really um, removing trends, uh, seasonal components and, and other features. Right, so um, how though, how, how can we start though um, building our probabilistic model. So how can we inject that covariance structure in, in our time series? Okay, so let's start with a simplest scenario, IID setting, also known as, as white noise. So um, uh, stochastic process is basically called the white noise if its elements are uncorrelated. Um, and it's got a mean zero and variance constant and equal to sigma squared. So, so the, the top time series plot shows you a realization from a Gaussian white noise where the, um, the, the, the marginal distribution is also taken to be Gaussian. And of course, the scale here, it, well, I, I'm not showing you the scale there, but that's just a, a zero mean. So zero should be here. And you can imagine that, um, well, the scale here ranges from minus three to three, just because the, um, the Gaussian distribution is taken to be uh, a Gaussian with uh, mean zero and variant one. Um, the interesting bit here is the, the bottom plot, um, which if you, I mean, if you zoom in or if you compare it with the top plot, you might see some similarities. So, so there is some sort of co-movement between these two time series. Um, so actually, um, you know, if, if, if we just notice our white noise uh, as it progresses, then we see a sort of dip here and the same sort of dip happens there. Similarly, at that, at that time point there and here. So, so actually, the way I constructed this bottom time series is just by filtering um, the white noise on the top. And by filtering the white noise at, at the top, really what I mean um, is that what I took is, I, I, well, I defined a new time series, let's say xt, uh, which is the average of the most recent white noise events. Um, so just, Quickly going back to these two plots, it might not be entirely evident, but um, well, these two, these two time series are plotted on the same scale. And, and what we can see is that basically the variance of this bottom time series is, um, uh, well, smaller than the, than the variance on, on, of the top time series. So actually, this operation of filtering here, or averaging white noise events, reduces the variance and actually in induces correlation in the system. I mean, a, a sort of trivial exercise is to compute the autocorrelation function of the above um, moving average, as is called process, uh, and also show it's stationary. Um, but we can just see the correlation being injected into that time series by looking at the sort of lag plots. So, so I've got three lag plots where I plot the process, the time series xt with uh, the lag process xt plus one. And it's sort of evident here that you have a positive correlation which somehow dissipates at lag two until it vanishes completely at lag three. So actually if you look at these at the time series, three lags apart, well, there is no overlap in the white noise events that could, be, that could explain this correlation. So just by introducing this, this little, little nice operation here, we see that we can just start putting correlation up to any lag we want. Actually, if, if I were to average the sort of Q most recent events, um, I could have the same sort of story. I could have a correlation that dissipates with lag until it sort of cuts off, off after the lag Q. Okay. Um, random walk. So random walk is, is, a, is a very important time series um, and, and 
stochastic process in general, but it turns out it's non-stationary. So a random walk is defined to be, uh, well, uh, the time series is, is known to be a random walk if its dynamics are given by, uh, well, just the value of where the time series was yesterday plus a disturbance or innovation WT uh, today. And just by plotting this, this time series over time, um, we'll see that it, it, it actually doesn't, doesn't look like it, its statistical properties remain constant over time. Well, you can sort of see these local trends. So if you would segment your time series here, you might observe local trends. But more importantly, what, what you can work out from this object here is that its variance is, is non-constant. So if we actually start from zero almost surely, um, then we can think that x1 is going to be zero plus a disturbance. So it's going to be just w1. Then moving forward, x2 is going to be um, x1. So just the innovation, just the disturbance, w1 plus w2. Eventually, solving this, this recurrence, you can write xt as just a sum of white noise events. So um, these are white noise events. So they are um, uncorrelated, or we might take them um, as independent. So in, in a random walk scenario, um, xt comes out to be just epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 all the way to epsilon t. Okay, and a simple cal calculation about the variance of xt shows that that's going to be sigma squared plus sigma squared, which is t times sigma squared. Okay, therefore the variance does not remain constant over time and it diffuses at, at um, root t. Okay, um, more interesting models. Um, so we've seen the white noise, we've seen the operation of filtering the white noise, which injects a correlation. How about we think of the simplest case, let's say, of that of autoregression, where our time series xt is nothing more but a scale factor of what the time series was at the previous day. So it's alpha xt minus one for some values of alpha, plus a disturbance wt. Okay, well, let's, let's have a look at that. How does it look like? Well, if alpha is taken to be positive 0.9, let's say, well, the present value is going to be more or less similar to, the, to, to, to yesterday's value. So it's going to be 0.9 yesterday's value plus a disturbance. So you see there is, again, some correlation in the system here. And just plotting the time series for the positive alpha case, you see, um, you see the trace, you see the realization. So, um, so actually, it doesn't fluctuate as much as the white noise. Instead, it moves slowly. That's purely an effect of the autocorrelation. Whereas if you take alpha to be negative 0.9, then you, you have an oscillatory time series which fluctuates uh, quite a lot. Okay, um, right, so we're talking about autocorrelations and autocovariances, but how do we get them from our data? How do we estimate them? Well, um, really here, um, what we want to do is just obtain uh, empirical analogues of the theoretical quantities of autocorrelation and autocovariance. So we can define the empirical covariance or autocovariance function um, for equally spaced data uh, to be nothing more but the average, say, of, of these product moments here. Um, so um, denoting by x bar the time series mean or average, uh, really what we're doing here, we, we're looking at the deviations of the time series at time i, uh, product with uh, the lagged time series uh, lag h, and we, take, we just take the average. Um, so there is here the notion of correlogram, which allows us to, to plot, say, uh, this function um, with respect to the lag. So the correlogram or the autocorrelation function is nothing more but the graph of, say, the empirical now autocorrelation function defined by the empirical covariance scaled by its variance. Remember, the variance is taken, taken at, at lag zero. And that's just the graph plotted against lag h where uh, the lag h is just purely uh, down to 
uh, our judgment, so we can we can pick a sort of maximum lag over which we can plot the uh, correlogram. Um, usually, n minus h minus one is replaced by n. So this minus n here comes from the degrees of freedom. It's a similar type of argument as with the sample variance. Uh, but often it's replaced by n, mainly because um, uh, the estimator that has n here, um, of course, is biased, but has better root mean square error. Right, OK. So here's a, a sort of very interesting theorem that we might uh, just want to, to dig in. So imagine you've got a white noise, Wt. And imagine that its fourth moment is finite. Of course, what's that fourth moment condition there? It might look funny, uh, but you can sort of think that it's like the, the variance of the variance of the white noise is, is finite. So it, it doesn't have very heavy tails. And consider now a stationary linear process determined by, uh, well, a sum, say, of all these white noise events, but weighted by some coefficient psi j. Okay, so that resembles this filtering operation we saw before, where we took the white noise and we filtered it um, by taking averages of the most recent white noise events. Though here, the difference being that um, we do allow in our construction of our model xt to, to put into future white noise events and past white noise events. So the sum here ranges from minus infinity to infinity. Um, and um, assuming a condition of this sort, uh, together with um, a condition on the coefficient psi for which we can construct a stationary time series. Um, we have the following result. Basically, for such a process, for any fixed lag, the autocorrelation function uh, will uh, converge to uh, a normal distribution with mean the true correlation and some variance uh, that will shrink to zero. So basically, um, rho hat is a consistent estimator. Um, and standard central limit theorem also holds in this case, which is nice. Uh, of course, the computation of the variance here might be complicated because it will be dependent on the size. Uh, but, but what is interesting here is that if xt is white noise, uh, meaning that the correlation will be zero, so white noise means all events are uncorrelated, all variables are correlated there. Um, so correlation for lag h larger than zero will tend to a normal with mean zero and variance and scales as one over n. So that's an interesting type of um, theorem here because it, it could allow us to sort of build or construct hypothesis, uh, statistical tests, let's say, for, for basically testing whether a white noise process is, sorry, for whether a time series process is white noise or not. How? Just by looking whether its autocorrelation uh, estimates are significantly zero or not. Right. Um, so aside from the correlation, um, in time series analysis, we, we pair the autocorrelation function or the correlogram with what is known as a partial correlogram, which allows you really to remove the effect of intermediate values in the time series. So for um, x0, x all the way up to xh, uh, imagine this being successive observations from a time series with some finite variance, and denote by x tilde not and x tilde h, the best uh, linear combination of the intermediate values of x not and xh, that is x1 all the way up to xh minus one, um, that minimize uh, the, mean, the mean square error that is the expected value of x naught minus x tilde x naught squared, and similarly for lag h. Um, and to see that, I mean, you can imagine your time series being a Gaussian. Um, therefore, let's say, um, if, if you have a time series which is driven by Gaussian white noise, or, or your time series being a Gaussian process, more generally, let's say, x naught all the way up to xh, um, can be, well, imagine that being a multivariate normal distribution. So what is really the partial autocorrelation um, here? Well, if that's a multivariate normal, well, marginalizing over any variable will still um, imply that um, we end in, in a multivariate normal distribution. So for example, 
the x naught all the way up to x h minus one will also be a multivariate normal. And similarly, x one x h will be a multivariate normal just because a multivariate normal is closed under marginalization. So the best linear predictors x tilde naught and x tilde h are nothing more um, but, well, if we were to write xh as a function of, sorry, xh, uh, apologies, x naught as a function of the remaining variables, well, we know the conditionals are normal, so there should be some coefficients uh, beta 1 x1 plus all the way to beta h minus 1 xh minus 1 plus some noise term epsilon, which is Gaussian. Similarly for xh, there exists some coefficients gamma 1 uh, x1 plus all the way to uh, gamma h minus 1, so apologies, h minus 1 plus eta. So the partial correlation, the partial autocorrelation is, is really the correlation between um, the disturbance terms in these two expressions. So the partial correlation here is the correlation of epsilon and eta. And intuitively, you can think about it as um, accounting for the effect of the intermediate variables. The nice thing is it's interpreted in sort of the same way as the autocorrelation function. And, and it's very useful in, in detecting um, uh, Markovian structure in time series. So if your partial autocorrelation uh, cuts off after a particular lag, that indicate, indicates that your time series um, you know, can, can be thought of as a Markov process with the order up to that lag for which the partial autocorrelation cuts off. Okay, so what is the effect of autocorrelation? So how does change inferential properties or statistical properties in the system? Um, so I think the best way to describe this is through, um, well, a very simple case where we just start thinking about what the variance, what is the variance of, of the average x bar, right? So in standard settings where our data are just IID from some distribution with, let's say, some mean mu and variance sigma squared, of course, I'm not indicating any distribution here. I'm just leaving it blank. We do know that the variance of of the average x bar is sigma squared over n. Okay. So we know that in the limit, as n grows large, the more data we collect into, into our analysis, um, our estimate is going to be, well, consistent, meaning it's going to converge with probability 1 to its true value. So how, do, how is this reflected you know, in the case where we no longer have IID settings, but we have a time series? Right, so, um, so a simple calculation here um, can show that the variance of, of x bar, the sample average, well, so what would that be in the case where we would have uh, autocorrelation or autocovariance in the system? So that's, let's write that down simply. So that's 1 n minus 1, x1 all the way to xn, and that's n to the minus 2 the variance of the sum. Okay. But because we do have, uh, because these random variables are no longer uncorrelated, when we are computing the variances of sums, we need to take into account the covariance structure. So you can imagine a sort of big, big matrix here where on the diagonal you've got the variances of the n of these. On the off diagonal you have n minus 1 lag 1 covariances, well then n minus 2 lag 2 covariances and so on. So that's going to be n minus 2 and uh, we'll have, well, n times the variance, so that's going to be n sigma squared plus um, n minus 1, the autocovariance lag 1 plus n minus 2 autocovariance lag 2 all the way to um, the last bit here, which is autocovariance with lag n minus 1. 
So we've got gamma n minus one times one. But we need to take into account also these guys over there. So there's a two coming out. So yes, Chris? Yes, I mean, you, you are right. I mean, two, two only enters um, basically in, in these coefficients here. Thank you. Thanks. So a simplification of this uh, formula leads to the first displayed equation, where you see now that the variance of x bar is just the variance divided by n. That's just something like sigma squared over n, similarly to the IID setting, times 1 plus, and now we've got uh, estimation of these uh, autocorrelation, uh, say, coefficients at all the lags. So imagine now what would happen if the correlation was positive at all lags. So basically, this guy here would be positive, which would mean that the variance would be inflated, as opposed to the setting where things were completely uncorrelated. So injecting correlation in the system inflates the variance, say, of the sample average. And you can sort of think that um, this quantity here um, changes, in some sense, the amount of information that you have. So in IID settings, the amount of information you collect are just n data points. In a time series setting where you have, again, n data points, you cannot regard your information as being collected in a similar way or being equal to that of coming from n independent data points, but um, it has to be smaller than that. So positive autocorrelation um, amounts to there being fewer than any independent observations. Okay, so um, how do we test whether we have autocorrelation or whether a process is basically white noise? So that's, that's very useful. Um, uh, that, that's a, 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 a very standard and useful procedure in, in, in time series analysis where you know, we typically detrend our series, we remove our, the cycles, and then in the end, we might be left with a sort of residual process that we want to see, uh, does it still have an autocorrelation structure in there or not? Um, so tests, um, statistical tests uh, have been developed for this purpose. So, um, you know, um, the sort of standard statistical test uh, due to Box and Pierce uh, which was later improved by Jung and Box, uh, uses basically the fact that for a white noise process, the autocorrelations are zero, um, but they have to be zero for any sort of lag. Okay, so um, the statistical test of Jung and Box, denoted by Q sub M here, uh, takes into account this, this property, so basically it's defined to be a scaled version of the sum of, again, properly scaled squared autocorrelation coefficients. And um, it's not surprising that this comes out as to be a chi-square with m degrees of freedom. I mean, in, in, the, in the limit, the co correlation coefficient here, the empirical correlation, has a normal distribution. So when you square it, you, you end up having a, a chi-squared. And if you sum m of these appropriately scaled to account for the variance of this autocorrelation coefficient, you end up having a, a chi-squared uh, with m degrees of freedom. However, you might start saying, well, how should m, what should m be? How many of these autocorrelation coefficients should I just put into that statistic? Um, and, and you can start, well, of course, trying to do um, the test for several lags here, m. Uh, but the sensitivity of q to different types of departure from the white noise uh, will depend on m in, in various ways. Uh, but if you think that you take M very large, then it's highly likely that you reduce the sensitivity of that test uh, because some of these estimates here will contribute no information about the lack of the fit. Uh, whereas if you take M too small, you again might reduce sensitivity of, um, of that test statistic uh, just because your estimates here should contribute information ab about the lack of fit um, that are missing. So typically what you do is you plot the significance level or the p-values, let's say, of qm um, for different m and just um, see if it's too small for a range of, of values. Okay. So in our, uh, I mean, there's a standard function in our box.test that comes with Bayes R. So here, for example, for the Lake Huron, we saw 
uh, right at the beginning, you know, if you just type box.test, uh, you give it a time series object and you specify the type. You can also put the, the sort of old box and piece here statistic. You, you'll get, uh, well, you'll, you'll get a p-value which is much less than 5%, so at the 95% uh, uh, confidence level, you, you reject the hypothesis that your time series basically comes from a white noise process. So there is some correlation in there. Okay, um, so another um, important uh, test for, for um, time series is, is that of station RD. So apart from just testing whether a time series is a white noise process or not, um, what is also interesting is, is it stationary? And um, uh, the test uh, I am describing in this slide has its root, roots from um, econometrics. It's called the KPSS test from, from its authors. And really it relies on, on you know, just postulating a particular model for your data. Okay, so um, so your, the model takes the form that is shown on the displayed equation. So xt here is just um, has a linear trend, xi times t, time, t is your time, um, plus now two, two stochastic processes, two time series here, uh, one eta, the other one epsilon. So here eta is assumed to be a random walk, whereas epsilon is assumed to be a stationary time series. So the test here is constructed really by, well, testing whether <coughs> the variance here of that disturbance or of that uh, random walk is zero. Um, in which case, if the variance of, of that disturbance W was zero, then eta wouldn't change at all. It would be always the same. Eta t would be equal to eta t minus one and so on and so forth. So really it would contribute as a mean level in the formulation of a time series here. Of course, the test um, also, also allows you to assess whether the uh, slope parameter xi here is, is zero or not. And there are two, um, two types, the, the so-called level stationarity, where you test jointly whether uh, the variance of the random walk is zero and the slope is zero, in which case you recover that x is actually exactly stationary. And there is also the, the trend stationarity where you just marginally test whether the variance of this random walk term is zero, in which case x minus its trend is stationary. Um, there are some details on the slide about how the test is constructed. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but um, I mean, it's, it's uh, useful to say that um, well, it, it leads to sort of nasty asymptotic distribution which, which comes out to be uh, an integral of a squ squared Brownian bridge uh, for the statistic defined in, uh, in this equation. Uh, but again, in our, I mean, uh, these tests come uh, with BASAR, no, no need for packages. It's called the KPSS test. And again, it, it's got an argument here that allows you to test whether it's trend stationary or level stationary. Uh, here for the sunspot, uh, for the sunspots time series, the annual uh, sunspots, you, you might just do the two tests separately. Um, so the trend uh, stationarity comes out with a p-value of, of 0.1, which is larger than 5%, therefore, uh, you know, leading us with not sufficient evidence to, to reject the null hypothesis uh, of the process being trend stationary. Uh, whereas for the level stationarity here, the p-value is sort of marginally less than 5%, uh, showing you some, some evidence for um, you know, rejecting basically the null hypothesis of the sunspots uh, being level stationary. And actually, you can sort of see that straight away from the time series plot. The sunspots sort of have a, an increasing trend over time. Um, but just thinking overall here uh, with these sort of results, at the end, it might not be um, too problematic, let's say, to fit a stationary time series to these data. Maybe it's not going to be the best thing, but we can try and do that. Okay, so how do we um, remove trends? How do we remove cycles and all the like? Um, so that's, that's really a very simple approach to, to doing so. Um, it's, it's really differencing the time series. Um, and to do so, we, we need to define um, what is known as the backshift operator. 
So the backshift operator B acts on stochastic processes. So B acts on xt and shifts it by one lag. So B times xt equals xt minus one. It's really an operator that acts on time series. And you can think that the first difference of a time series xt, let's, let's call it dxt, um, is equal to i minus b times xt. So just expanding the bracket here, I'm going to get xt minus bxt, therefore it's xt minus xt minus 1. And higher order differences are constructed in a similar way. So the second order difference here is just a difference of the differences. And um, uh, it's, it's really um, taking basically i minus b to the power 2 acting on the time series. So the nice thing about this um, operator is that it allows you to remove um, polynomial trends, basically. So if, if you imagine you had a linear trend, then a first order difference would basically filter it out. Um, actually, it's quite nice that um, if you have a time series or if you have a sort of model where it's got a polynomial trend, so P here denotes a polynomial of order um, K, let's say, plus some noise, then it turns out that the kth order difference uh, removes that trend. So it's a sort of high pass filter in some extent uh, that removes all, all the low pass uh, oscillations. Um, so for example, you can think first order differencing in the random walk setting. That would lead to just the white noise, which is stationary. Um, or you can also think about removing cycles by taking, uh, say, uh, well, a higher order differences here, but not, not in the sense we described before, but in the sense of, sorry, taking uh, your, your time series xt and taking away, say, uh, the time series lagged at minus k. The issue with differencing here is that, um, although it's nice and intuitive to difference your series to remove the trends, it can result in, in complications. It actually uh, complicates the dependent structure or it can inflate or deflate the variance, uh, and so on. So beware. So don't just feel like, ooh, I'm just going to take uh, my nice favorite backshift operator and apply it on the time series or take the first order differences, and I'm fine. It needs more thought into um, you know, why should we really model or, or difference our time series. Right. Um, so. That's, that's where we're leading to the end of the time series basics here. So I, I really want to stress on, on what is known as a causal process. So we, we saw, again, that idea of injecting correlation into the system by filtering the white noise. And um, we defined, really, the linear uh, time series to be uh, a linear combination of all the white noise events throughout the whole uh, universe, let's say. So xt is a sum from j equals minus infinity to infinity of coefficients i j times white noise events lagged by j. Right, we saw some conditions on these coefficients here for that process to be stationary. And, and we somehow quickly um, mentioned that you know, the difference between the example we had initially with the moving average is that, well, in this representation, we do allow future white noise events to influence the present value of the time series. Right, so a causal process really is a process where um, any, any psi um, for which you know, it couples with a future white noise event is zero. So uh, psi minus one, psi minus two, for which we would be getting wt plus one, wt plus two, is set to be zero. Therefore, there is direction flowing only it, well, we only have a flow in one direction from the past to the future, okay? And not from the future to the past or the present. Uh, and that's quite important for forecasting, basically, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do forecasting. Um, okay, so, so a causal process really truncates this sum, so by setting this size here of all the future events to be zero. Uh, but using the backshift operator, we can do right say, the lagged white noise events by powers of the backshift uh, acting on the white noise process. And, um, you know, eventually we can combine this into a very nice notation, very compact notation. So just by replacing uh, 
are wt minus, minus j by b to the power j wt uh, and defining the uh, sort of uh, operator psi b here to be equal to that expression down here. Um, we can sort of compactify this, this uh, notation into a much simpler one. Okay. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say about time series basics. And um, we'll move on to um, the, the sort of standard time series, standard linear time series, uh, which are the ARMA processes, which are really combinations of moving averages and autoregressions. Um, and nicely enough, we'll see that these also come up to be linear stationary time series. So everything we've said so far applies for these processes. So what is an ARMA process? Well, to understand the ARMA process, it's, it's useful to split everything into in, its pieces. So it consists of an autoregression and a moving average. So let's see what's an autoregression. So definition here, pretty much, uh, we've got the autoregressive process, which is actually an extension of the AR1 process we saw before. So an autoregressive process order P, um, shorthand is ARP, is of the form uh, XT being a linear combination of its past P values uh, plus a disturbance WT. And we do assume that X is stationary here um, and um, alpha one all the way to alpha p are constants for which the, the last one, the pth one is, is non-zero. Uh, that's basically needed to, to have order p, otherwise we could reduce it to order p minus one if the pth was zero. Um, and we can also extend that to a process that has non-zero mean, so I should, I should stress here that uh, the ARP process of this form um, has zero mean, uh, but you can replace it to uh, an autoregressive process with non-zero mean by just replacing these x's here by uh, x minus a constant level mu, which will happen to be the mean of the process. So it's really like shifting the process by uh, a constant level. So, um, you know, um, employing or using again our favorite operator here, our, our buck shift operator, uh, we can uh, rewrite this, this expression by, by having, well, let, let's see that. Well, xt minus one will be bxt, xt minus two will be b squared xt, all the way to b to the power pxt. And if I just take all these terms to the left-hand side and pull xt out, I will be left with my xt minus alpha one xt minus one minus alpha two xt minus two, and so on. So the backshift operator can, uh, well, allows us to also write the autoregressive process into a nice form. Um, for which we shorthand we write it as the autoregressive operator alpha b, uh, given by this this expression, um, and this also suggests that we could write our time series x t to be the reciprocal of this autoregressive operator times the white noise, and that that is useful if we basically want to get the causal representation, which is nothing more but the linear combination of all the previous white noise events. Okay. Um, of course, to find psi, I mean, the standard trick is to, to expand this polynomial here, this reciprocal of the polynomial into a sort of binomial series or Taylor series, if you like, um, which allows you to, to get the coefficients of psi um, as a coefficient in, in the Taylor series representation. So similarly, we can have the moving uh, average process of order Q. So, um, so XT here is defined to be a linear, a linear combination of the past white noise events. So XT equals a disturbance at time T plus a weighted combination of the Q previous white noise event. And again, these thetas here, these coefficients are constants for which theta Q, the last one, is not zero, just to retain the order Q. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, things uh, extend to in, in a straightforward manner as before. We, we can shift the process by a constant level. So if we want to have a process which is uh, a moving average but with mean nu, we replace xt with uh, xt minus nu. Again, we can define the backshift, we can use the backshift operator to compactify this uh, equation here. So, so again, we can write all these white noise events as, well, products of the 
powers of the backseat operator times the white noise at time t, uh, in which case we can pull out the white noise at time t and retain this uh, uh, moving average operator. And unlike the uh, autoregressive process for which uh, conditions are needed on the coefficients, this process is always stationary. I mean, it's just a combination of white noise events um, for any values of theta. And here's, a, here's an exercise um, uh, that asks to, to see basically that if you take two moving average time series, both order one, Okay, so imagine you have two time series now, MA1. One is with coefficient theta1, the other one is with coefficient 1 over theta1, theta1 being the same guy there. The question asks you to um, show that the statistical properties basically are, of, of these two time series are the same. Um, just to show that the MA1 processes with these two different parameters are statistically indistinguishable. So, so if we write down the dynamics of these time series, so we've got an NMA, MA1, zero mean, let's say. So xt is going to be um, equal to the white noise wt plus theta wt minus one. And it suffices to just compute, I mean, the covariance, uh, the autocovariance of the time series at just two lags, at lag zero and lag one. So if we look at uh, lag zero, so that's going to be the variance of xt. Okay, these are uncorrelated uh, white noise events with variance sigma squared. So you have a sigma squared from here and a theta squared times sigma squared from there. So you're going to have, you can pull sigma squared out and lead to the variance of your MA1 process being sigma squared times 1 plus theta squared. Okay, how about the autocovariance, say, at lag one. I mean, in a similar calculation, we can have gamma one here being the covariance of xt with xt minus one. And let's just replace these two guys by their uh, equivalent representation. So these are MA1 processes. So we have wt plus theta wt minus one and I've got a wt minus one for the second bit plus theta wt minus two. Okay, so now we need to notice that these are white noise events, therefore t with t minus one is gonna give me zero covariance. Um, t with t minus two is gonna give me also zero covariance. However, that's, that's a term where it's gonna influence the autocovariance, whereas this one is also gonna give me a zero. So basically, if I were to write the covariance of these two variables explicitly, I would end up having the covariance of theta uh, times wt minus one with wt minus one, and I can take theta out, and I'll result with a covariance of the white no noise with itself, uh, which is theta sigma squared just by taking theta outside and having the covariance of wt minus one with itself, which is the variance of the white noise sigma squared. Right, so we've got two objects here. We've got gamma naught gamma one. Let's see the correlation. So the autocorrelation at lag one is gonna be the autocovariance at lag one scaled by the, the variance gamma naught. So that's theta sigma squared over, um, and we had sigma squared here, one plus theta squared, right? Okay, surely now, if we change from theta one to one over theta one, let's say a one dash for the second time series, so it's just changing theta here to one over theta. So that's gonna be one over theta divided by one plus one over theta squared. Right? And if you pull the one over theta squared out, put it on the top, you'll see that that's exactly equal to theta one plus theta squared. So the two are exactly the same. Basically, if you, if you get two MA1 
time series, one with coefficient theta, the other one with one over theta, their autocorrelation functions are exactly the same. So that's a shame. Um, so we need some sort of conditions to, to well, keep bits of, well, keep those we want and keep those we don't want, um, purely for identifiability reasons. Um, so a moving average is called invertible. A moving average process is called invertible if it has an infinite autoregressive representation. So that's just the dual representation of the linear time series. So remember before we saw that we can write a time series or a causal autoregressive process as an infinite linear combination of all the past noise events. Now what we're doing, we write the white noise as an infinite linear com combination of all the past values of the series. So it's just the reverse um, calculation really. And we call the, the moving average process to be invertible uh, if it has this representation. And that's just needed to ensure identifiability so that we don't end up having uh, two time series with the same correlation function but different uh, coefficients theta. One, let's say, being theta, the other one over theta. Right. Um, I mean, I'm going to leave that as a sort of exercise, the, the second bullet point here, to check that um, for this example, we just went on the board, uh, which, which of these processes is invertible. Um, but what I want to move on quickly now is um, the combination of these two models, of course. I mean, we didn't say much about where these models are useful so far. Where, where is an AR process useful? Where is an MA process useful? Okay, that purely depends on, on their structural characteristics. So an AR process has a specific autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation behavior. And similarly, the MA process also has a specific uh, behavior for its autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation function. Um, in some way, we can think that the autoregressive processes are, are quite useful processes because just they relate the present with the past. So they've got this diffusive behavior. Whereas the white noise, uh, sorry, the moving average processes really link your present value with combination of past white noise events. So, you know, the purposes of, of, the, model, of, of the models, sorry, the, the, your modeling purposes will dictate which one is, is best for your analysis. Um, however, the combination of the two really, you know, gives you a, a sort of big grand model, if you like, uh, with which you can, uh, uh, you, can, you can play with and do data analysis. So, so the moving average process of order P and Q, shorthand ARMA P and Q, um, it's just a combination of the two. So your present value is equal to a linear combination of the P previous values of the series plus a disturbance, term W, plus now a linear combination of past disturbances. Okay. Um, of course, the usual trick to shift the process by a constant level and get a mean mu, just replacing this representation xt by xt minus mu. Um, and, and again, using our back shift operator, we can you know, boil this equation down into a much more compact uh, expression. So we do write a b times xt equal theta b wt, where a and theta here are being the uh, autoregressive and moving average operator respectively. Okay, so um, the properties of this process are, is intimately tied with, with the properties of these polynomials here, of these operators. Um, say alpha z and theta z, for which we might take z to be just a complex number. Um, and um, let's define, say, uh, d here to be uh, the unicircle. So it's all, all the complex uh, numbers for which their modulus is, is less than one. That just denotes a unit disk in the comp complex plane. Um, okay, the first point we might want to make is that, you know, if these two operators here had common factors, then they would just knock each other from left and right hand side. So basically, we don't allow ARMA processes for which the autoregressive and moving average operators, you know, sharing the same factors. That's just called parameter redundancy, basically. Um, so again, we can think about whether an ARMA process is causal. So you know, just starting by the defining equation of the ARMA process, um, we uh, define it to be a causal process if it can be written as an infinite linear combination 
of the past by noise events. Uh, so therefore, we get the sum of coefficient psi times previous white noise events, where the psi's here are absolutely convergent. And that ensures causality. So there is uh, only one direction from, from the past to the future. And actually, it's invertible if it has this dual representation now, where the white noise is written as an infinite linear combination of the past, no of the past values of the series. So in, in the first case, x is written as a function of w, if you like. In the second one, w is written as a function of x. Okay, both cases require, I mean, causality and invertibility require absolute summability here of the uh, coefficients of the series psi and pi. And, and we end up with uh, the theorem. So an ARMA PQ process is basically causal if actually this autoregressive polynomial alpha of z cannot be zero within the unit disk. And similarly, it's invertible if this autoregressive, sorry, if this moving average uh, polynomial here cannot be zero within the unit disk uh, as well. Or in other words, if the roots of both a and theta lie outside the unit circle or outside the unit disk. So th there is some fascinating and beautiful math, you know, uh, there are the beautiful math behind why that's, that's the story, but we, we're not going to, you know, uh, delve into too much detail about that. Of course, in practice, um, you know, if you want to basically assess whether your time series, your ARMA time series is causal and invertible, you would have to check that by uh, basically finding the roots of these two polynomials uh, and checking whether they are uh, outside the circle. But why ARMA processes, right? I mean, why do we want to use these processes? Well, really, um, you know, they're, they're sort of combinations of two different models with, uh, that share some dual properties, and they have some, some sort of um, intuitive, uh, uh, you know, explanations. However, if you combine them, you might start thinking that we lose this intuitive explanation of, well, why w will we want to use the ARMA process for modeling our time series, right? I mean, it's typically used as a, you know, more, more of a, an empirical sort of model uh, where our you know, estimates of these coefficients, the autoregressive coefficients and the moving average coefficients are nothing more but just summary statistics, um, you know, but with no re real implication about you know, what's a scientific um, basis of the phenomenon under study. Um, however, um, you know, because it's a combination of two still flexible models, you can think of the ARMA processes or the ARMA models as being a quite flexible class of, of time series, purely because they do allow uh, a wide range of behavior for their autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation functions. So, of course, increasing the orders here will give input more flexibility at the cost of putting more parameters into your system. And, um, uh, you know, it can provide uh, effectively uh, a wide range of, of, of different types of behavior. Um, however, um, even with, you know, P and Q being of small order, they can still uh, give you uh, flexible, flexible uh, time series models. Okay, so I mean, the most, the most important aspect for these processes is that they're quite useful for forecasting, um, so, um, or for settings where the autocorrelation function is not just of primary interest. Um, so, so just to recap, um, ARMA models will not tell you really why your data behave the, the way they do. I mean, they just don't serve as models for you know, explaining the scientific basis of your phenomenon. It's really empirical models that allow you to tease out these properties for your time series, okay? Um, purely second order properties, autocovariance and autocorrelation. Instead, if you split the R mind to its you know, building blocks, which, which is the AR and the MA, then you might have um, you know, more interpretable models. For example, the autoregressive models, they do have Markov structure, right? I mean, Given, if I'm the present, well, given the knowledge of the present, past and future is independent. Or, for example, if I want to predict the future, I might only need the two previous values, let's say, or the, the, the uh, yesterday's value. Um, 
So just Markovian structure, which you'll see in more detail in, in part two. So actually AR models are, are much more interpretable. Uh, similarly with MA models, these stem, stem from weighted averages of white noise events, and they could be interpretable as well. Um, so just a quick illustration here, how do we fit armor models in R? So here are annual sunspots. We'll just uh, go back to our initial example with the time series of, of sunspots. So there, there's a, a wealth of um, you know, functions and, and packages in R for time series analysis. The base R comes with AR or the function ARIMA or ARIMA.sim. So AR fits AR models. ARIMA can fit more complicated models like ARMA and integrated ARIMA, which we haven't, which we are not going to cover. Whereas the ARIMA.sim allows you to simulate from the models. And my favorite, my favorite, which is the forecast package. Um, so if you want to have you know, a functionality for uh, fitting MA processes, or if you want to have automatic model selection, uh, then you can use auto ARIMA. So here, I um, mean, just a quick example, just fitting the model to uh, the data just by using BASAR. So we have, we're storing in AR.model uh, the output of the function AR fitted to, say, uh, the sunspot data. Um, and we obtain, say, um, through automatic model selection, uh, a ninth order autoregressive process. So basically, the AR model here, the fitted model, gives nine coefficients. So the order of the AR is nine, and we can see the sort of estimated coefficients here. So the first, the first coefficient, alpha one, is positive, then becomes negative and negative, then positive, negative, and then starts somehow alternating. Um, so if, if you look at your time series more closely, I mean, you might just start and ask, you know, how does the correlation look like? Well, basically, if you look your time series at, uh, say, nine years, nine to 12 years apart, it's more or less the same. However, if you look at it over five years' time, you know, lag five, you'll see that it's quite different. So basically, there, there is both positive and negative correlation in the system there. And hence, the, the reason for you know, having to, to, to have all these coefficients there, just to mimic the properties of, of the series. OK, so you can, you can basically obtain the fitted values just by subtracting the residuals from, from a time series uh, and just overlay them on the graph. So OK, I mean, it doesn't look to be that bad. Of course, we're not doing anything sophisticated in, in this case. We're just comparing, really, the actual data with the, the fitted values. Uh, of course, you know, if we want to be more punctual and more systematic, we would have to plot the residuals. We would have to look at their autocorrelation properties, and we would have to just double check that you know, our model uh, des describes sufficiently well uh, the time series pattern here. Okay. Right. Um, okay, I mean, what if, though, we have multiple time series? So we no longer collect just a single time series, okay? So you know, the armor models extend again in a very nice way to, to vector autoregressions or, or vector armor uh, models. So here, um, you know, a simple case can, can be the vector autoregressive, which is also, it can also be fitted with the function AR in, in, in R. Um, so, so here you've got basically XT to be not scalar, but just a, a vector with K elements. Uh, and these K elements change over time. So a simple case is the vector autoregression, which is, well, just again, the sum, say, or, or linear combinations of the past values of the series. Okay, so here the A, uh, capital A, are just K by K matrices. And if we just want to think uh, of what, what's the effect in terms of you know, describing the present value, in terms of the past information, well, for the graphical summary here. You know, if, you, if we just think of the simple case where we've got xt to be alpha, xt minus one, and that's a k by k matrix, you know, xt is gonna be a, a vector of k elements, so I can write it as a vector. 
uh, which is going to be equal to, well, I'm going to have elements here, alpha 1, 1, alpha 1, 2, alpha 1, k, all the way to alpha k1, alpha k, k. And this mat matrix need not be symmetric, right? Times my uh, multiple time series of time t minus 1, element 1, uh, yeah, element k. So really, if you want to, you know, delve deeper into, you know, how, how these dynamics actually link with the present value, well, let's just focus on one component only. So the first component here is going to be basically the inner product of this vector with that vector. So the second one is going to be the dot product of the second row with the same vector and so on and so forth. So in other words, each univariate time series is written as a linear combination of all the previous time series at the previous uh, day, let's say, if we were recording things in days. So there is dependency now in the present value, you know, for each component here. This component is not only dependent on, on itself, but it's also dependent on, on other measurements, or on other uh, time series. Okay, so that's a quite intuitive uh, model. And um, you know, it extends nicely to the autoregressive moving average as well. So we've got the VARMA model, for which we can allow dependency on past white noise events. Again, now these uh, events here are also vectors. Uh, and the theory somehow extends, well, I wouldn't say in a straightforward manner. It, it, it becomes more subtle. Uh, in, in particular, we need more complicated conditions to ensure you know, uniqueness and identifiability. Um, you know, but you can, you can sort of uh, avoid this by fitting just vector autoregressive models, which are quite uh, useful and intuitive. So here's another example on fitting VARMA models in uh, you know, European uh, stock, stock prices. So, so instead of basically using the actual prices, um, we're just taking returns. So that's, again, an example or a plot we had uh, initially where we motivated, uh, say, the lecture. We had, say, the German, Switzerland, French, and, and, and London stock exchange uh, here, though, showing the, the returns. So if you remember initially, both these stock indices, sorry, all of these stock indices had an upward trend. So it would be quite, quite a silly thing to go and fit a stationary time series there. Um, you know, Varma models or would, wouldn't be a reasonable model uh, to, to fit. Uh, however, um, looking at returns only or log returns, we see that, um, you know, these time series now uh, do have a constant mean. And to some extent, we might just then think, you know, think, well, their statistical properties might not be changing that badly over time. Um, and actually, if you plot the autocorrelation functions and partial autocorrelation functions of these processes, uh, you'll see no structure, which, which will to some extent tell you that, well, a stationary time series might be good. Uh, but of course, there might be structure in higher order moments, like the variance, that we don't take into account here. Um, but we just go straight and fit a VARMA model or a, a vector autoregression. So in Bayesar, um, that you know, you can use either AR or you can use the package MTS, uh, standing for multiple time series. And if you fit um, the VARMA, automatic model selection will give you uh, practically zero uh, mean, zero vector mean, um, which is not surprising. But it will also give you an order one vector autoregression. Auto so you only need one matrix, as in here to describe the present value of all the series in relation to the, present, to the past values just, just uh, the day before. So remember, these are daily prices. OK, so uh, a quick thing here is, well, we know that the sample size is around 1860. So 1 over the square root of the sample size is about 0.023. And that helps us you know, gauge, basically, which of these coefficients are uh, statistically significant or not. Um, in fact, uh, it turns out that most of the coefficients that are uh, significant are basically for Pucci, CAC, and, and SMI. And, and if, you, if you just read that matrix, uh, you, know, you see 
really that all these stock indices react posi positively to a jump in, in the FTSE. So the, the, all of these coefficients are positive. Potentially for CAC as well, with the exception of, of the FTSE. Um, and um, actually they react negatively to a jump in, in the SMI. So um, whereas for, for the DAX, um, well, these coefficients actually are not, are not significant. So maybe we might want to say that um, you know, the, uh, these, these indices here are somehow, somehow, somewhat decoupled from, from the German market. Um, so, you know, you see this idea here of using these time series just to, as, as empirical models to tease out some properties of, 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 the, uh, of our data. Right. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm now going to cover the, the most important bit, which uh, I believe for ARMA processes is, is forecasting. So a um, few words before, you know, we just go straight and, and try to predict the future. So prediction is dangerous, right? Um, why? Well, well, we seek to use observed data to make predictions about as yet unobserved events. Um, and why is this so difficult? Well, there are three things we need to bear in mind. So I'm just going to read them. So we've got unknown unknowns. First one. So there are unforeseeable changes in the underlying process that could occur. Change points, structural breaks, um, innovations coming from governmental laws or physics we might not have predicted that could occur in a future time point. Uh, these are unknown unknowns, right? We, we just have no control over them. Um, on the other hand, we do have known unknowns, uh, and basically that means that you know, we forecast using a model or a collection of models uh, that depend on now known quantities. I mean, the fact that we're estimating those quantities does not mean that we know the quantities exactly. Right? So there, is still, there are still known unknowns there. Uh, there are parameters to be estimated. Of course, there are unknown knowns, um, which means that even if we knew the structure and parameters of the model, you know, there is intrinsic variation. You know, the, the output is random. It's not a deterministic, it's not chaotic uh, evo evolution of, of, of a sequence there. And of course, just a funny one, there's the only known known, which is people tend to underestimate or maybe neglect some people, uncertainty. Okay, so let's have a look at the simplest sort of toy example, right? It's not, we're not in time series dependent situation. Let's think we, uh, we have data generated by a sort of straight line regression, okay? So uh, we want us to predict the value, call it x plus, plus for prediction, uh, at a future time n plus h, and we only collect the data up to time n. Um, and our data come from this straight line regression, so xt is some coefficient, some, some intercept beta naught, plus a slope parameter beta one, times time t minus t bar plus wt. You might start wonder why do I put the t bar? I mean, I could, could, I could have changed that t bar there. We could, could have removed it, and it would have been absorbed in beta naught. I mean, it's just a way of reparameterizing linear regression to make the estimates of beta naught and beta 1 uncorrelated. Um, so time is 1 up to n, and we've got a white noise. Basically, we can have a Gaussian white noise here. We can think of WT driven uh, by Gaussian white noise. And T bar is just the average of, our, of time. And um, it turns out, I mean, it's a simple exercise to show that the least squares estimates um, are, you know, for the, for the intercept, we've got X bar, whereas for the slope, we've got this expression. So it's, it's a sort of scaled covariance somehow. We've got the sum of XT times T minus T bar divided by the square, well, the sum of the squares, or the times, or the deviations of the your time from the average. Um, okay, so the natural predictor, if you like, I mean, if we were to know the model exactly, the natural predictor, let's call it tilde x, for, la for uh, h step ahead, uh, would be just, you know, let's plug in our intercept slope, and for, you know, for our time step, which is h, let's just replace time by n plus h minus t bar, right? Um, so, okay, what, what about the variance of that predictor? 
Well, of course, there will be some uncertainty in these parameter estimates here. So the variance, let's call it function v, function of, of um, uh, the step ahead forecast, which in this case is taken to be h, um, is going to be the variance of the average, which we saw it's just sigma squared over n. There's no dependence in, in the data x here. Um, plus now the variance of this term, okay, so a simple calculation quickly shows that this term takes its form. So the form is, is a fraction where in the numerator we've got the square of n plus h minus d bar, and the denominator we've got uh, the sum of, of um, you know, the square of t minus d bar. Okay, but now if you just focus on this expression, that's just the variance of your predictor, right? And we are under optimal setting. We know the model exactly. So we've got very good estimators here. They are uncorrelated. So what's the variance? How does this variance behave? Okay, well, surely it increases quadratically in this quantity here. Okay, but, well, if you think that, you know, if you fix H, yeah, so if you fix H as being like the day ahead forecast or 10 days ahead forecast, H equal 10, let's say, is going to shrink to zero as N grows to infinity. So the more data we collect, our H step ahead forecast becomes better. How, how is that the case? Well, if n increases, we're going to pull n out. It's going to come up as n squared. But here we are summing squares, and these grow as cubes. Therefore, you're going to get a 1 over n term there as well. In the end, you're going to get basically a zero bracket here for fixed h and increasing n. OK, so that's good. So if the model is correct, the future observations here, um, you know, xn plus h, which are going to be given by, you know, the equivalent by the defining equation plus the future disturbance, um, you know, can give us a, a sort of closed form expression for the variance of the deviation of the predictor from the true value. Okay, so that's easy to see that that's going to be sigma squared plus the variance which as the sample size grows, it's just going to come up to be sigma squared. Okay, so the terms in, in this expression, in expression five, represent basically the uncertainty due to this intrinsic variability in the system. Our system is, is random. It's driven by white noise with variance sigma squared. And, and that basically due to estimating the system, which is the variance V. And actually, on top of that, we must add the variability, the, you know, the variability due to guessing the system. And in this case, we have added plus zero variability because we know exactly the system is a linear regression. But in the case where we didn't know that, we would have to add that too. So there are three you know, important quantities here when we, you know, we need to bear in mind when we're forecasting the future. There is intrinsic variability, there is uncertainty due to parameter estimation, and there is uncertainty due to model selection. You know, and that's just a simple straight line regression, right? So imagine, you know, that carrying in a you know straightforward manner to a time series. So, okay, what is forecasting? Forecasting predicting the future uh, based on the data collected up to the present, and for the purposes of this, of, you know, of our, of our lectures here, we assume um, some some sort of fixed model, ARMA, let's say. Uh, but you know, often we might want to fit several different models and pull forecasts from, from all of them. Um, you know, actually, we might end up in situations where different models fit the data equally well but give completely different forecasts. So still, we might want to do some model averaging there. Okay, so to do, to do, this, uh, to do this thing, we need to estimate the parameters of the model. Um, you know, but as we said, even if the model structure is known, you know, had the model structure been known, the, the estimates wouldn't, wouldn't have been the true parameters uh, that gave rise to the data. Um, so we use the assumed model structure and the estimated parameters together to form our prediction, basically. Um, and again, due to the intrinsic variability, you know, even if the model structure and the, and the parameters are known, there will st still be randomness due to this intrinsic uh, variability of the system, of the stochastic system. Okay, let's assume, you know, we know the system and we know the parameters and let's, let's deal with the, uh, the one component only 
of uncertainty in forecasting. Um, right. So we seek to predict the age step ahead. Uh, and I think it's, it's intuitive or useful to think that straight line regression. But now in the time series setting with the effect of autocorrelation inflating the variance, complicating things even more. Okay, so here's um, a quick uh, lemma for starters. So the conditional expectation basically of uh, the eight step ahead value per time series conditionally on the history up to time n where we observe the data actually minimizes, sorry, minimizes a prediction mean square error for that future observation based on the data. So it essentially minimizes this decision rule. Okay, that's quite a very, uh, a very useful result. And um, we can think that this conditional expectation basically will be a nonlinear function of the data. Uh, but for the purposes of, of the lecture and the, the linear time series we're looking, it suffices just to think that this conditional expectation is just um, uh, a linear function here of what we observed up to time n. So our eight step ahead forecast, you know, we might want to uh, form it as linear combinations of our data up to time n. Okay, supposing, supposing we've got a mean zero, we've got under a stationary time series uh, mean zero. What we ideally would like to do is to minimize or to find those coefficients lambda that minimize that prediction mean square error. And we can expect that more weight is gonna give to recent history than all the way to the past. Uh, and these could uh, also be probability weights. So prediction for armor, so I'm gonna skim that uh, quickly. So that's, um, you know, um, ideally our forecasts need to be functions of the data, but of course it helps um, to, uh, well, in mathematical sense and terms, it helps to uh, use the causal representation where we write our time series as a function of the white noise events. So here's a, a theorem. So the best linear predictor say h step ahead x tilde for xn plus h in a causal armor process is actually, um, uh, well, it's, it's related to the coefficients of, of um, the, the causal representation of the time series. So it's the sum from lag h to infinity, psi j, w, n plus h minus j, and reading that, that out loud, it's psi h, w, n, plus psi h minus one, w, n minus one, all the way to the past. So there are no future events. You know? So in predicting the future here, we are not using any of the future events w. And that's due to causality. Um, so, so x tilde can be evaluated from the linear representation, from the causal representation with unrealized innovations. So as if we had zero future events. Okay, so, so let's see that theorem in some more detail. So, Consider the linear predictor, so that's just a function of your data, lambda i, xn minus y, and we take a, a linear combination here, and noting basically that, you know, if x is a causal series, we can write it as an infinite linear combination of the white noise events, okay? Therefore, take that guy here, take your linear predictor, okay, and replace your x by its causal representation. So we've got a sum of weighted, say, infinite order linear combinations there. The key thing here to see is that, well, fix i to be zero, you're gonna have the coefficient lambda zero, and then you're gonna be starting, start, you know, weighting all the past white noise events. So i zero, you're gonna have n minus j, so you're gonna start from n, n minus one, n minus two, and so on. Actually, if you expand the brackets here, the key thing to notice is that this has also a linear form in the Ws, where we can just postulate that you know, there exists some unique lambdas here for which that is exactly equal to that expression. So our linear predictor now, with the use of the causal representation, is written here as a combination of the white noise events. And for the prediction mean square error, well, take your actual value minus its forecast, square it, well, it will come up to to be exactly equal to the intrinsic variability sigma squared, plus say um, the first h of these coefficients squared, plus now 
the square deviations of your psi, the coefficients in the causal representation, minus the coefficients we postulated there. So the key thing to see here is that this quantity is going to be minimized basically when, well, that's positive, and that's also positive. So basically it's minimized when exactly, you know, when, when psi i is exactly equal to lambda i minus h. So we might take lambda i to be psi i plus h, leading to minimum uh, prediction mean square error. And that's good news, right? The prediction, therefore, you know, we know exactly what lambda i's are, so we can shove them in and basically end up with the result of the theorem. So um, computations, I mean, of course, this causal representation helps in terms of the maths, but what we really want to do is have, say, um, expressing our fore forecasts of function, as functions of the data. So how do we compute them in practice? So in practice, we really compute them using the defining equation of the ARMA model. So we start by the autoregressive operator uh, times the, the forecasted value being equal to the moving average operator times the uh, residual uh, at, at, at lag h. So, so here the residuals and the fitted values or predictions are obtained recursively. So, so basically, um, I'm just going to see one quick example on obtaining forecasts. Okay, so, so the residuals are just the, the actual minus the fitted. So, um, so we've got these, these two expressions here for both the residuals and the forecasts. So for forecasts, well, if t plus h is within our sample, well, it's actually the actual value, right? It's not even a forecast. Uh, whereas for h being larger than 1 and t equal to n, let's say, um, then the forecast is just given by the defining equation of, of the armor. So we just write this in longhand here. Um, and noting that we obtain the residuals just by taking the uh, actual values minus the fitted ones. So here's a quick example which is showed that the eight step ahead prediction for a you know, causal AMA 1 1 process, which is given by this equation, are basically the, the next day ahead and the H days ahead uh, are of this sort. And for convenience, we're also given, say, the coefficient psi in the causal representation. So how can we obtain the uh, forecast? So we've got an AMA 1 1. I'm just going to quickly go through all over that, which is xt equals alpha xt minus 1 plus um, wt plus theta wt minus 1. So, so the forecast, the day ahead forecast, t plus 1, is going to be alpha xt plus wt plus 1 plus theta wt. And that's just the next day ahead. Of course, at time t, this is equal to the actual. So we've got alpha xt. Uh, and well, I'm, I have no idea what the you know, future white noise event is going to be. So that's set to 0 plus theta wt. So we see we might have to evaluate or calculate a residual there. Whereas for the, fo the two day ahead forecast, we've got alpha xt plus 1. Uh, well, here I'm assuming basically a t equals n, right? Uh, so we've got x uh, tilde x t plus t equals alpha tilde x t plus 1 uh, plus w t plus 2 plus theta w uh, t plus 1. So these are future, both these are future white noise events, so they dump out. And I'm left with alpha tilde x t plus 1, which is equal to alpha times alpha xt here plus theta wt. So to obtain you know, the forecast fully, I really need access to the residual wt. And that also has, you know, needs to be computed recursively. So for the residuals, okay, so we've got w uh, 
t being, say, the autoregressive operator at the forecast minus, say, uh, theta uh, here, uh, w t minus 1. So that's the recursive uh, equation. So we start with w1 is going to be um, x1 minus alpha x0. But of course, we haven't observed anything, so we set that to 0. And that's minus theta w0. And that's also the case for w0. We haven't observed that. So we set that to 0 according to these equations. And we end with the residual being exactly equal to the value of a series. We move on to um, the residual at time 2. That's going to be x2 minus alpha x1 minus and then we've got theta w1. Therefore, that's x2 minus alpha x1 minus theta. And for getting the residual time 1, well, we just calculated that. That's x1. So the tildes are being dropped just because we are within sample. Therefore, these are observed. But that formulation can be recursively used to you know, end up with an answer for w tilde n for which, um, or WT, sorry, which we need for the day ahead forecast. So just the sort of mechanics or algor algorithm for you know, calculating the forecasts, really. Um, so that's pretty much what's on this slide. Um, I'm just going to quickly conclude with three comments. Um, First of all, um, you know, for the best linear predictor with um, you know, shifted process by a constant mean mu, um, the best linear predictor is also of the same form, just plus mu. Uh, but for ARMA processes, because this psi j is converged to zero exponentially fast, uh, we have really that the forecast after you know, a long uh, day, a step ahead will basically dump to the mean. So the forecast, if you look at a very long forecast, really what you're going to be uh, answering as your predictions is the mean of the process. Uh, so likewise, for large uh, age, the prediction error is also going to be, um, well, effectively equal to this infinite series just because this converges exponentially fast to zero. Um, and we can compute the prediction intervals for the future value simply by taking our best linear predictor, just calculated from these recursive calculations there, uh, plus minus the quantile of the appropriate distribution uh, times the, the mean square error uh, rooted. So just to conclude, so this is, this, um, these two plots here show the forecast for the sunspots. So again, in R, um, a sort of favorite package here, forecast. Um, so, uh, you know, is used to, to forecast uh, basically the, the, the fitted AR model with the nine coefficients. 30 years ahead and, and 100 years ahead. So um, these are plotted on left and right hand side separately, respectively. And you sort of see, at least from the left hand side, um, you know, there, there's, there's a good match. I mean, there's a sort of reasonable match. It, it looks like the time series has captured this momentum in the series. So it, it's going to oscillate. But eventually, as you look longer and longer, you know, time horizons, the, your forecasts are going to dump to the mean. Okay, so that probably tells you that, well, there there are some unmodeled components in that series here that you haven't quite accounted. Still, though, I mean, even a stationary series, you can see what what type of forecast can it, it can give. Um, surely, though, we have just you know the. Um, what what we've done here with, with a computer is nothing more, um, uh, you know, but put here the innovation uncertainty or the disturbance uncertainty. We haven't really said anything about model uncertainty or estimation uncertainty here. So, um, you know, this previous discussion uh, needs, needs correction, needs uh, more thought. So a way of, um, say, adding the other two components, not just the intrinsic disturbance, intrinsic uh, randomness is through bootstrap simulation from which we can, you know, create basically pseudo data sets by simulating from the fitted model and then refitting the time series. So um, 
just a quick algorithm here. You know, we, we can start by, for example, uh, simulating x1 star up to xn star from, from a plausible model of our choice, the armor model. And once we simulate these new pseudo data sets, we can fit, say, the same model class to these data sets, but choose, again, the best model by some sort of information criterion like the AIC. So this best fitted model to the pseudo data set um, you know, is used to obtain a forecast for each of these data sets. And, and all these uh, replicates are combined to assess the uncertainty of the original prediction. But of course, to do that in practice, you would require some automatic you know, model choice. It cannot be, uh, you cannot start simulating millions of new data sets and you know, manually uh, selecting your, uh, your best model. So um, I'm going to stop here. Uh, that's pretty much part one. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Chris, which is going to be describing the more advanced time series methods. Thank you.